Hello and welcome to Down the Scope. Today we'll be looking at the anatomy of the shark digestive tract. As usual, you can access fully zoomable digital versions of all the slides via the website at downthescope.co.uk. Links to the slides are in the video description. Sharks consume a diet which is high in protein and fat and certain aspects of their digestive system are adapted to deal with this composition. The digestive system starts with the mouth. You'll notice that sharks don't have a tongue. All they have is this slightly raised area supported by a piece of cartilage. Without a tongue you'll wonder how sharks are able to taste things. Taste is not a well-developed sense in sharks, but they do have receptors throughout the mouth which sense fat content. This allows the shark to decide whether something is worth the bother of eating it, but only once they've taken a bite from it. It was only recently that anyone took an interest in shark taste bud structure, and a 2016 paper by Carla Atkinson contained some wonderful scanning electron micrographs showing taste papillae just behind the teeth. From the schematic drawing in this paper, we can find maybe one or two structures, specifically in this slide 244, that look like they could be taste papillae. All we have here is a bulge of the epithelium, filled by a plug of connective tissue. Atkinson demonstrated the presence of a nerve within these buds using special stains, but unfortunately we'll just have to trust that within this bundle of turquoise connective tissue, there is a nerve. I mentioned that the taste papillae are just behind the teeth, and teeth are one of the things that people will instantly think about when they think of sharks. In the overview video of these slides, we surmise that the specimens here are still developing, since there is a prominent yolk sac present within the abdomen. Since they're being fed by the yolk sac, they don't need teeth with which to catch prey, and this feature is still developing. We can see the developing teeth as this vague area of cells clustering together and perhaps forming a little bit of mineralized tissue down here. If you'd like to know more about shark tooth development, then there's an excellent, relatively recent paper by Liam Brash, which I used to identify the developing teeth in these sections. From the mouth, food passes to the esophagus, which we can see here. From here, the digestive system is essentially one long tube with a similar structural pattern all the way to the anus. Starting from the external surface of the tube, there's a sheath of connective tissue. The next step are two layers of muscle fibres, which are orientated perpendicularly. One is transverse, transverse, going around the gut, while the other is longitudinal, orientated along the gut. This was the same arrangement that we saw when looking at the muscles of an earthworm, and they essentially serve the same purpose, to squeeze the contents of the tube along, in this case, the digester. On top of the muscle layer, there's a layer of connective tissue called the submucosa, which is generally filled with blood vessels and other useful structures. On top of the submucosa, there's a thin muscle layer called the muscularis mucosa, which isn't very visible in the esophagus. This acts as a division between the submucosa and the mucosa. The mucosa on top consists of the epithelium, or surface cells, and the connective tissue underlying them is called the lamina propria. The epithelium tends to be the most specialised part and will differ the most between compartments of the gastrointestinal tract. Here in the esophagus we can see lots of cells with a blue stained cytoplasm. These are goblet cells which are secreting mucus, presumably to lubricate and make swallowing the dogfish's me meal a lot easier. Further down the esophagus, you'll notice that the surface of the epithelium looks a bit fuzzy. These are cilia on the surface of other epithelial cells, which will waft the mucus layer about to distribute it. Between the esophagus mucosa and the muscle layers, you'll notice a homogeneous mass of cells. This is the Leydig organ, whose principal role is to produce red and white blood cells. In mammals, these processes happen mainly in the bone marrow, an anatomical feature that isn't present in the dogfish due to their cartilaginous skeletons. As we reach the end of the esophagus, we can see the epithelium abruptly changes as we enter the stomach. As in other vertebrates, the stomach in sharks is adapted for acid digestion of proteins. 
Sharks tend to eat their prey whole or in large chunks, so the stomach is their first opportunity to break down solid prey into a digestible goo. The stomach is also a useful adaptation for food storage. If it weren't there, the shark would have to eat more constantly. But seeing as the stomach can act as a large dilatable sac, you can also use it to store food for longer periods of time. In sharks, the stomach is divi divided into two regions, a muscular pyloric region and a glandular cardiac region, which we can see on these slides. The glandular region is lined by columnar epithelial cells, which we can see here. These have mucus secreting goblet cells among them, or these more uh, blue staining cells. Their function is to protect the underlying tissue from the acid and the digestive enzymes which are digesting the food above them. You can see there are periodic breaks in the epithelium called gastric pits or foveola, such as here for example, here and here. These lead to the gastric glands which are lined by a single type of cell called oxynicopeptic cells that secrete both acid and zymogen, or pepsinogen, a proenzyme which is broken down by the acidic conditions of the stomach to form pepsin, which will digest proteins. As well as activating the enzymes, acid conditions are useful for breaking down hard elements of the meal, like skeletons, as well as killing any bacteria that might be hanging around. If we take a quick look at some mammalian stomach, you'll see that they have a similar structure with a, a, a mucous epithelium lining gastric glands. However, if you look closely at the gastric glands, you'll see that there are two distinct types of cell. One is specialized for acid secretion and the other enzyme production. In the shark, the oxynicopeptic cells assume both roles and only one shark species, the six gill shark, has been shown to have two cell populations as mammals do. However, the distribution of the cells in this species is different. Whereas in the mammal, you can see that glands are made up of both kinds of cell. In the six gill shark, glands are lined by only one type of cell, but there are two different kinds of gland. This represents an example of convergence evolution, where a similar trait has evolved in two distinct lineages of animals, independently of one another, but to fulfill the same purpose. If we switch over to slide 249, we can see the stomach here. After the stomach, sharks have a short intestine. This isn't equivalent to the long mammalian intestine, which is split into three segments by various anatomical and functional features. Instead, we can split the shark intestine into three sections, proximal, spiral and distal. On these slides, we can see the proximal and spiral sections. The intestine is the site of more chemical digestion and absorption. As in other vertebrates, sharks have a pancreas, which is just here. The pancreas produces enzymes for protein, fat and carbohydrate digestion. Here we can see the pancreatic cells arranged in asini, or rings of uh, cells with a, a lumen in the middle. The cell nucleus is close to the basement membrane, leaving lots of cytoplasmic space for enzyme production. The enzymes are then released into the central lumen of the acinus from where they will enter a duct system which leads to the intestine. As well as pancreatic enzymes, the intestine will receive bile from the liver which helps to neutralise the acidic stomach contents and create an environment suitable for the more delicate pancreatic enzymes to work. As you can imagine, due to their high protein diet, Shark pancreatic enzymes mainly focus on protein and lipid digestion, with very little secretion of carbohydrate digesting enzymes. After the proximal intestine, we reach the spiral intestine, so called because, as you guessed it, there's a spiral valve within it. The spiral structure increases the surface area for nutrient absorption. Since sharks have relatively short intestines, they need to maximise the time that food spends there. The spiral valve is thought to slow the passage of food, increasing the time for further digestion and absorption. The overall anatomy of the spiral is best viewed in slide 241, but if we want to understand more about the structure, then slide 249 is better. 
Here we can see that the spiral is formed by an extension of the submucosa, which wraps around itself. The morphology of the spiral varies a lot between species. Some intestines have a more scroll-like appearance as opposed to a spiral. Other variations include the direction of the spirals and where the submucosal extension that forms the spiral originates. The number of spirals can also vary a lot, from as little as two to as many as 50 spirals. Within the spiral intestine, we can also make out the structural layers of the gastrointestinal tract, starting with an outer serosal layer, followed by muscle layers, a very small submucosa, and then a lamina propria, which supports the epithelium. The epithelial cells themselves are thrown into villi by the lamina propria. Here we can make out some of the basic structure of the epithelium. This area here is known as the crypt. This is an area of cell division and crypt cells here will have a high mitotic rate. As the cells divide, they're pushed up the villus where they begin to differentiate. Some of them will form these goblet cells here which secrete mucus and others will begin to form uh, enterocytes or the epithelial cells of the intestine. Within these sections, we have very good cytoplasmic detail. You can appreciate that the cytoplasm of the crypt cells is much darker staining and less abundant than that of the epithelial cells that are reaching the tip of the villus. You can imagine that the cytoplasm is distended with all kinds of different proteins. Not only will these cells be absorbing small molecules from the digester, but they'll also be producing enzymes with which to break down larger molecules into absorbable smaller molecules. We can also see that these cells have a slightly fuzzy appearance to the luminal aspect. These are microvilli, which again increase the absorptive surface area. Epithelial cells will continue to be pushed up the villus until they reach the tip where they begin to die and are sloughed off. Here the nuclei are not as round with uh, much more condensed chromatin. This suggests to me that these cells are in the process of dying and are about to leave the villus. The spiral intestine empties into the distal intestine which will lead to the rectum and cloaca, the common exit of the intestinal, urinary and reproductive tracts. These further structures don't appear on any of the slides, so our exploration of the gastrointestinal tract must stop with the spiral intestine. Instead, we can finish off this video with a look at the shark's liver. Sharks don't have fat cells, so instead they have to store fat in the liver. This acts as an energy store, but also helps with their ability to float in water and not expend so much energy swimming and preventing themselves from sinking to the bottom of the sea. The liver is made up of large cells. Within their cytoplasm, we can see large, clear vacuoles. These would have been filled with fat. Looking at the quantity of fatty vacuoles in these cells, it's no surprise that the shark liver has a greasy texture to it. The cell nuclei of liver cells, or hepatocytes, are large with dispersed chromatin. The hepatocytes are organised in plates that are a few cells thick. Separating each plate is a sinusoid, which we can see here. These are effectively blood vessels lined by endothelial cells, which have these thin, flat nuclei, like this one here and this one here. Blood from the digestive tract will flow through these sinusoids and offload recently absorbed fats to the hepatocytes, as well as, as, well as other molecules. Hepatocytes also produce bile, which is excreted into small ducts called bile canaliculi. We can't normally see these with a light microscope unless they're distended for some reason. The canaliculi empty into bile ducts, which we can see. For example, this duct, lined by cuboidal cells, is a bile duct. It's accompanied by a hepatic vein, which will be carrying blood from the gastrointestinal tract. You can even see a few smaller veins branching off and heading towards the sinusoids. This arrangement of bile ducts with veins is common to all vertebrates. But in higher vertebrates, like mammals, they're usually accompanied by the hepatic artery, 
which form a structure called the hepatic portal triad. In sharks, the hepatic arteries are absent, so we're left with a duo of vein and bile duct. In fact, the whole liver is far less organised than that of mammals, with thicker plates and less frequent vein-bile duct combos. So that's a quick review of gastrointestinal structure in the dogfish. If you want to know more, I can recommend the chapter in Fish Physiology on Elasmobranch Digestive Structure, which I use as the primary source for the information in this video. A link to the chapter is in the description. If you have any questions, leave a comment below and I'll do my best to find an answer for you. And don't forget to subscribe for more videos on the anatomy and histology of the dogfish and other animals. If you want to see the slides of tissue from other animals, you can visit the website. There's a link in the description. Thanks for watching and until next time, goodbye.